Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm Ian Golden, I'm the director of the school. And it's an enormous pleasure to welcome this evening uh, Professor Hein de Haas. Uh, Hein is uh, someone who's been involved with the Oxford Martin School really since its inception. Uh, he was one of the founding members of the International Migration Institute, which was one of the first research groups we started in 2006. Uh, he started that together with Stephen Castles and Oliver Blackwell, who is good to see here, um, and have turned the Migration Institute into a real force for research uh, and analysis across the world. Uh, there are many places in the world that study migration, uh, but there are very few that study the relationship between migration uh, and development uh, and take the perspective of both the developing world as well as the advanced world. So it's a delight uh, to see Oliver here. Stephen Castles uh, left to go to Sydney, uh, was replaced as director by Robin Cohn, and it's great to see Robin here as well. Uh, and this institute continues to evolve. But alas, we lost Hein three months ago to uh, the University of Amsterdam, uh, where he's now a professor of sociology and starting a migration program there. Hein was also a professor at the University of Maastricht, uh, has many, many accomplishments to his name, is a co-author uh, with Stephen Castles and Mark Miller of the Age of Migration, uh, has worked extensively uh, in the field, not least in North Africa, uh, on migration and provides a perspective which I feel is so lacking and so urgently needed uh, in the current environment, which is putting facts in front of fears. Uh, and that's really what characterizes his work. Deep, solid research, uh, empirical analysis, uh, which speaks for itself through what's really happening as opposed to what the headlines are in the paper. So it's a delight, uh, Hein, to have you here, welcome you back to uh, your home in Oxford, uh, and to have you address us on Behind the Headlines, Investigating the Drivers and Impacts of Global Migration. Thanks a lot, Ian. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's a delight to be back in Oxford after three months only. It's like I've never been away. Um, I'm a return, temporary returnee here. That's how I feel. I'm going to talk about migration. Well, migration is an issue that rises high hopes and deep fears, as Ian already has alluded to. And despite its hotly debated status, it's still a poorly understood issue in many ways. And what I'm trying to do today is based on research we've conducted at the IMI, and particularly in one project I'm going to present, is, is trying to investigate what are really the drivers of migration, what can we say based on facts rather than on fears about migration. But also, more generally, what does migration mean? What is migration? Because if we follow the debate, we see sort of two camps, even in academia, and certainly in the political, political sphere, is a sort of anti- and pro-migration camp. Well, that is an entirely naive and, I think, wrong way to think about migration, because what typically happens in those debates, both camps cave in, use arguments and facts that serve their particular arguments, and it's not really a debate on migration in terms of what really drives the process. The fundamental point I will try to make today is that migration needs to be reconceptualized. We need to rethink migration as a normal process. Not necessarily as a good or a bad process, as a normal process. And to argue against or in favor of migration would be almost be like arguing, let's say, against or in favor of agriculture or trade. It would be like thinking away a fundamental element of who we are as human beings, who we've always been. That is not to say that I'm saying it's good or bad. I say it's inevitable. And any policy to try to think away that fundamental point that migration is here to stay is in that sense bound to fail. And I think that's a very important point. As we say at IMI, we need to reconceptualize migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of change and social transformation. Before I, I will start my talk, I want to, to thank 
uh, the European Research Council and the Oxford Martin School of making possible a five-year-long investigation, which we ended a few months ago. It's a project called the Determinants of International Migration, where we try to assess the drivers of migration, and in particular, the influence of policies. What can policies do in terms of steering the process? And I also want to thank my collaborators at uh, the IMI that have co co contributed to making that project into a success. And as part of this DEMIC, Determinants of International Migration project, we have collected a few new databases which provide unprecedented coverage in terms of global migration flows and global migration policies, which form the basis of quite a lot of the uh, 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 facts that I'm going to show to you later. First of all, we've collected so-called bilateral migration flow data between countries in the world, about 34 destination countries. We've collected migration data since the Second World War, and this includes about 50,000 bilateral migration flows. For those interested in the details, please visit our website. I don't have time to go over this in much detail, but I just want to quickly flag what we have collected. We also collected total migration flows to and from a large range of countries in the world, even back to the 19th century. We've also collected data, also since the Second World War, for 45 countries about migration policies. And we've been able to include 6,500 policies and coded them in terms of type of policies and whether those policies have become more or less restrictive. And last but not least, we are still in the process of completing a global bilateral visa database, which includes data since 1973 on visa, travel visas that countries have imposed on one another. Once again, I don't have time to fully address all of these databases. Please go to the project website, the DEMIC website, at the IMI website, if you're interested in more detail. As I've argued, I will try, today I will try to highlight that we need to fundamentally rethink the way we think about migration, that we conceptualize migration. And I will do so by highlighting a number of migration myths that you can hear in the media, but also in a lot of research. And these are not necessarily only what I would say, say right-wing myths about migration. These also include left-wing myths. I think that's one of the problems. The debate is so much entrenched to pro- and anti-migration arguments that we lack a more scientific view on migration. We need to rethink human migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of change. I think urbanization is probably the best example of that. If we look at the last two centuries, you cannot really think about urbanization and the whole process of economic transformations, meaning a transfer of economic activities and labor from the rural sector to the urban sector without migration. And on the other way, other, the other way around, we cannot really understand the modern experience of migration, both within and across borders, without taking into account that broader process of industrialization, mechanization, urbanization, and modern state formation. I will highlight this need to rethink migration by addressing a number of migration myths. The first one is that we live in a time of unprecedented mass migration. This has been very much fueled in recent years by media coverage, for instance, about refugee flows into Europe, but more generally the idea that the rich countries of the world are under increasing migration pressure. This is very much an image we are getting, and it also seems somehow commonsensical because we often hear about increasing international divides between countries in terms of economic wealth. Um, we also hear about increasing attempts of states to try and contain migration. We get this impression that the pressure in poor countries to migrate to the rich world is increasing. This is not only a media story, also very serious academics, for instance, Paul Collier, an Oxford-based development economist, has published a book under the title Exodus. And the title is quite telling. It gives this image that there is an enormous amount of people right now on the move, for instance, from Africa to Europe. And if nothing, is be, <coughs> nothing will be done about it, that these numbers will increase rapidly in the future. And that what we are seeing right now in terms of refugees and migrants coming into Europe is only a sort of first stage of a future migration influx, which will become a real exodus. So, and also, 
globalization. Commonsensically, we think, yes, increasing ease of transport and travel around the world, technological development, has it made easier for people to move around? So it seemed logical that there is more migration and we can expect much more migration to happen in the future. And this is what we see back every year again when the International Organization of Migration, IOM, or the UN Population Division, publishes another report that migration reaches an all-time high and will only increase in the future. It adds to the sense of urgency. This is a big issue and something needs to be done about it. So this idea of migration being on the rise and increasing fast is fueled by many actors. We also hear it from the climate change sort of uh, angle, that climate change will rapidly increase migration in the future. Everything seems to add on to the idea that we are facing a massive increase in global migration. Now, if we look at the best data available from the United Nations Population Division and the Global Migration, Bilateral Migration Database of the World Bank, if we look at the total estimates of numbers of migrants around in the world since 1960 up to 2010, it seems to confirm this image, that we see a strong increase from about 90 million international migrants who are defined as persons who have been living in another country than the country of birth for longer than one year, up to 220,000 million, what am I saying, in 2010. However, if we express this number as a percentage of the world population, quite a different image occurs. See what happens. The percentage has remained remarkable constant over the last half a century, around 3% of the world population being an international migrant. Some migration scholars have argued that actually one century ago, with the great migrations from Europe to North America, this percentage may have been much higher than it is actually now. And whatever way we look at the data, we cannot construct a sort of narrative of global migration being on the rise. And that challenges a lot of the assumptions we have about the nature of migration and about what it drives. Because we expected these percentages, a sort of acceleration of migration because of globalization, because of growing, growing international inequalities. And apparently, it is not happening. Just to put a refugee issue in perspective, and I do this because it's been so much into the debate, these are other estimates about absolute numbers of refugees in the world. And we've seen those numbers fluctuating, and of course, in very recent years, which aren't included in these years, these numbers have gone up a little bit in absolute numbers with main concentrations in Africa and Asia, if we express these in percentages of the total migrant population, these percentages are relatively low. If we look at the world as a whole, less than 10% of all international migrants are estimated to fit into this refugee category. That is not to say that refugee issues are not an urgent issue, but the construction of an image of refugees now being the main source of migrants to Europe, which sometimes um, emerges uh, from media coverage is a fundamentally flawed one. Even on the level of Europe, where we of course right now see an unprecedented, or what is seen as an unprecedented influx of migrants from Syria and other conflict-ridden countries, if we look at very recent estimates by the Center of Global Development, which expresses the number of refugees in the European Union as a percentage of the total population, the current increase is fast indeed, but still hasn't reached the levels we've seen in the times of the Balkan Wars, uh, particularly around the Bosnia crisis. So again, this is not an unprecedented uh, phenomenon in that sense, in numerical terms. I also want to remind you that total migration to the European Union over the last 10 years, and I'm talking about legal immigration, has been between two and two and a half million. So still, even if one million people would arrive, these are big numbers, but still it's not the main source of uh, migratory movement to Europe, even in a time of uh, conflict uh, in origin countries. So we cannot really talk about an exodus, neither, nor can we talk about an, an invasion. But the question is, of course, what has changed? And if we look at the global migration patterns and also using the data available, of course a lot has changed. And it is particularly the changing place of Europe on the global migration map over the last half a century. Because for centuries, Europeans were the ones who moved out, who colonized, who occupied, who created new states in their colonies. And those processes have been fundamentally reversed since the end of the Second World War for reasons I cannot go in full detail, but still it's linked to demographic change, to decolonization, to st strong economic growth in Europe. Europe has 
become a global migration magnet. Instead of being a prime source of migrants to the settler colonies around the world, particularly the Americas, Europe has become a prime destination for migrants, partly from former colonies, but also from many other countries. So the role of Europe has fundamentally changed. And these are estimates based on the data we have collected of total migration from outside the EU 25 to the EU 25. So this is not migration within the European Union. And we can clearly see that in recent years, those figures have hovered around between 2 million and 2.5 million a year, much higher, for instance, than migration to the United States of America. So it's a sort of reversal of global directions of transcontinental migration uh, movements from outbound to inbound in terms of Euro European perspective. So we may live in an age of unprecedented migration from a European perspective, but you can e even draw that further in the sense of that the composition of global migration populations has become less and less European because the drying up of Europe as a prime source of migrants to the Americas, to Australia and New Zealand, to South Africa and to other settler colonies has had fundamental implications for the composition of migrant populations to those countries, which have become less and less European and more and more Asian and Latin American and to a much more limited extent African. So the global composition of migrant populations has fundamentally changed. So from a Eurocentric perspective or from a even, I would say, North American, Australian, New Zealand perspective, populations have fundamentally changed, have become less European, and that has been the main change, obviously. Not in terms of numbers, but in terms of composition of global migrant populations. Of course, other things have changed. This is an election poster from the Swiss Population Party. Migration has become an issue of high political salience. And I think more or less the beginning of that increasing salience of migration, the increasing portrayal of migration as a security issue and a threat to the welfare state and a threat, um, even uh, a potential source of terrorism, has started with the end of the Cold War. And I don't think that is coincidence, because from a Machiavellian perspective, a leader needs an enemy. And if the Cold War enemy of the communist threat has fallen away, the migrant and the asylum seeker is a very convenient other category to scapegoat. And I don't think there is a coincidence in that coming up of the migration issue exactly at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s and the increasing political salience more generally of migration issues. It's another, this is another Swiss poster referendum uh, about the construction of mosques and minarets in, 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 in Switzerland. This is my country, very clearly, the suggestion, minder veilig, meer veiligheid, minder immigratie. It means more security, less immigration. This is not concealed, it's out in the open in the political domain. The English press is a very welcome source as well of nice headlines. Migrants sent our crime rate soaring. We must stop the migration invasion. And only very recently, some senior UK politicians have described migrants and asylum seekers as swarms. Uh, that will be waiting in Calais. So very much the staging of migrants as an external threat. However, this is not necessarily a new issue. This is a, a newspaper cutting from the Daily Mail, 1938. German Jews pouring into this country. It's quite shocking if you read the actual article, the same discourse is about there's too many coming and we need to be able to send them back. And the article was talking about stateless Jews from Germany. Now we know why they were stateless. Um, and sort of similar discourses evolved in the lead up to the Second World War about influxes of refugees. This is a brochure, a cover of a brochure from the Ku Klux Klan, 1923, The Menace of Modern Immigration. It's quite interesting to read this. I found this in Ellis Island Immigration Museum. Similar discourses about migrants being a threat to cultural homogeneity, to security, to employment, and so on and so forth. Another poster, 1902, anti-Chinese Chinese mass meeting. This was um, around this Chinese Immigration Exclusion Act in the United States. So this is not a new phenomenon at all. We have been seeing flare-ups of anti-migration xenophobia in several eras. It is also not something that is a prerogative of Western countries. This is a cover of a Moroccan weekly, Le Péril Noir, The Black Danger, talking about increasing numbers of sub-Saharan migrants settling in a country like Morocco. 
So in a way, this is not a new issue, this is not a particularly Western issue. Migration has been politicized in other epochs as well, and also outside of the West. But something else is going on than just politicians ranting against migration. It's also the securitization of migration. This is a map produced by the Netherlands Ministry of Defense that shows an image of the world having a lot of problems, and that problems generating migration to Europe. The grayish zone there is called the belt of insecurity. So all running from the Caribbean region across most of Africa and the most of the Middle East moving eastward. Um, environmental problems, uh, population pressure are cited, and then you see the purple arrows to Europe which represent increasing migration pressure onto Europe. And the military have been quite keen. And again, this is not something that is covered or hidden, quite out in the open. Migration is staged as one of the threats coming our way, and we need to mobilize quite literally resources in order to try to stop that invasion from happening. So migration is a, becoming an increasing topic of securitization. So we see the mass politicization of migration, increasing media coverage, adding to this image, we face a time of unprecedented migration. Second myth. Immigration policies have become more restrictive. You would think so if you look at the newspapers right now, the border constructions, the fences that are being erected on the Hungarian border, increasing attempts by Eurosur and Frontex to try and so-called secure the European maritime border. Well, many migration scholars have argued that the prime target of these policies is performative. And what happens in terms of real rules of entry is quite a different and much more nuanced picture. So what we've tried as part of this DEMIC, Determinants of International Migration Policy Project, is trying actually to count and to collect a database of 6,500 different migration policy changes enacted in a whole range of countries since 19 the whole last century, and particularly with an emphasis on the post-war period. And we have coded every single policy change, and we gave it a code of minus one when the policy change moved into a less restrictive direction, for instance, increasing possibilities for labor migrants to come, or relaxing criteria on family migration, or making it easier to become a British or a Dutch or an American citizen, and we coded it with plus one when the policy became more restrictive. And as a first exercise, we try for every single year in the database to calculate the average. What has been the overall direction? If you take all policy changes together, is the policy change more or less restrictive in that year? And this is the image you get. What it shows, and just to explain, the black line is zero. So every year that the line is below zero, the average change has been in a less restrictive direction. And every year it's above zero, it means policies overall for all these countries together have increased in restrictiveness. And it shows a picture that is remarkably consistent what we know about pre- and post-war migration policies. That in the lead-up to the Second World War, borders were closed increasingly. After the Second World War, we saw a very rapid liberalization of migration policies, which lasted far into the 1980s. But what surprised us in the research team, that even in more recent years, the average has hardly moved above zero. And how can we explain that? Perhaps we can explain it if we look at different type of policies. Because if we look, and here we draw several lines for different type of target groups in terms of migrants, if we look at high-skilled but even low-skilled workers, policies generally have been quite liberal. And particularly for the high-skilled migrants, they have become increasingly liberal over recent years. If we look at other categories, particularly irregular migrants, and that is the dotted line, that's the only line, only target group that has consistently remained above zero. One footnote I have to make is that many asylum seekers are categorized as this category of irregular migrants. This is a huge issue, and actually it's not really justified, but they're often lumped into that category. I'll come back to that later. But what we see is that for most policy categories, most migrant categories, migration policies have become less restrictive. What we see for family migrants, in the last 10 years, more restrictive measures have been enacted, but they haven't totally counterbalanced less restrictive policy changes. This seems to conform 
what scholars like Freeman and others have argued, that there is a built-in tendency in liberal democracies for attributing giving more rights to migrants. It has to do with human rights arrangements where countries have to comply to, that it is not actually very easy for liberal democracies to make migration extremely difficult. But it is also linked to all sorts of policies that have been enacted over the last 10 to 15 years, particularly towards the highly skilled, the wealthy, and students to make their entry much more easy. But also think about the European Union, the freeing up of the European as a space of free mobility, and there are other similar spaces in the world that have made it easier. If we look at different types of policies, we also can see a clear differentiation that the only type of policies that have become consistently more restrictive are the border and land control policies. If you look at legal rules for entry and integration, for instance, the acquisition of citizenship, they have consistently moved in a less restrictive and more liberal direction. So the focus has very much been on this external visible side of border controls. If we look at exit policy, we see a change from policies in the 1960s and 70s that tried to make it easier for migrants to go back by, for instance, giving them return premiums to much more coercive, coercive policies uh, like deportation back to origin countries. But what we also see, we have constructed a visa index, and this is one example of the average numbers of African countries that need, uh, from different African regions that need visas to get to the OECD, that at the same time of creating more entry channels for the highly skilled, for students, uh, for wealthy people, at the same time free entry in terms of travel to Europe and the OECD has been progressively blocked from people from poor countries like in the case of Africa. So what we get here is a very ambiguous picture that in a way shows that migration policy is not primarily about numbers because this is where policy makers and politicians emphasize it's about selection. And you can perhaps say that contemporary migration policies increasingly follow an economic logic which pri privileged the already privileged living in origin countries. So it makes it actually easier for high-skilled Africans, for instance, to migrate, has made it much more difficult for low-skilled. What about the third idea, that migration restrictions reduce migration? Seems logical. You enter a barrier, you, you introduce a barrier, so less people will come, right? Seems logical. The problem is that this type of reasoning doesn't look at the entire migration process about going and returning and how people migrate. And again, from the project, we concluded there are a number of unintended consequences, which we dubbed substitution effects, of migration restrictions. These have also been described in previous studies, and also our data analysis seem to uh, corroborate these. First of all, people simply shift categories. We know the examples. If people can't migrate as labor, la uh, labor migrants, people may enter under the family migration ticket, for example. The second one is a less well-known, although Kerry Peach here in Oxford has described this for the so-called West Indies when the, the United Kingdom introduced m migration restrictions, is this idea of now or never, if a migration restriction is looming ahead on the horizon, people may take the chance to migrate before it's actually too late. And here the research by former IMI research officer Simona Fetzoli is, is, is very interesting, the case of Suriname. Suriname used to be a Dutch colony. Before, and Dutch uh, Surinamese citizens used to be Dutch citizens, so they had free migration rights to the, to, 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 to the Netherlands. In the beginning of the 1970s, there was increasing concern in the Netherlands about this free migration of young Surinamese men to the Netherlands, which has accelerated negotiations about Surinamese independence. And Hans van Amersfoort, a Dutch uh, migration professor, has argued it has put a lot of pressure on the process, and Surinamese elites were aware of this, that the Dutch wanted to hastened that uh, Surinamese independence, and they negotiated agreement that the Surinamese would still have free migration rights up to five years after independence. Now, independence happened in 1975. What did Surinamese people think? It is now or never. And we see a huge migration hike just before independence, and then visas were introduced in 1980, and there was a second now or never migration hike. And this is how 40% of the Surinamese population ended up in the Netherlands. So the policy produced exactly the opposite effect of the intended effect. Second, third, an unintended consequence of immigration restriction is that you interrupt circulation. 
because, again, we have good reasons to assume that if you make it more difficult to enter, once you're in and you've taken the efforts of paying a smuggler, for instance, or securing a very expensive visa, you're much likely to go back. If you become unemployed, you have free migration rights, for instance, like the Polish in the UK, you're much more likely to go back, awaiting better times back home. Once you put restrictions in place, the chance of doing so is much lower. And again, we have estimated this also statistically. I cannot go into full details about the estimation methods, but this is a paper I've written with Matthias Tsaika. We have estimated if a state introduces a visa, what does it do to migration flows from particular origin countries? So if, for instance, France introduces a visa for Algerians going to France, what happens? And we've done so that for all the countries included in the database. And we have estimated the average effect of the introduction of a visa over time. Now we clearly see that after a few years after introduction of a visa, immigration flows do decrease. However, also outflows, proxying return flows, also decrease. What it actually do, does if we make the sum between immigration and emigration to make an estimate of overall turnover or circulation, it pushes circulation down. And this is statistical evidence confirming earlier studies that have argued that, for instance, the introduction of restrictions for uh, Bracero workers in the United States from Mexico or for so-called guest workers in Western Europe have, have uh, encouraged migration, migrants to stay put instead of returning. And we seem to find similar evidence here. A fourth unintended consequence we can actually see in the news, and I don't have to explain too much about it anymore. It's simply when the Hungarian hung builds, uh, government builds a fence, people will simply start to take other migratory routes. And this is something that already started much longer ago. So-called irregular migration across the Mediterranean is a phenomenon that started in 1991. And why in 1991? Because that was the year that southern European countries had to introduce visas for North African citizens. And this was the time when the irregular migration phenomenon came up because migrants kept on migrating despite a semi-militarization of borders here in the case of Ceuta and Melilla. These are Spanish enclaves on the Moroccan coast. And we have seen a huge diversification of migration routes away from just the Strait of Gibraltar covering the entire North African coast and even now the West African coast as potential crossing points. People simply diversify their uh, strategies. And I actually have to redraw this map because, as we know, uh, the routes through Turkey and the Balkans have become very important in recent years. One other consequence is the increasing death rate. It has also been quite well documented by several other researchers of those attempts to stop migrants from coming. And Jürgen Karling has drawn this graph depicting the sort of vicious cycle of more people dying at the border, more calls to intensify the fight against people smuggling, more anti-smuggling measures, but actually making migrants and refugees even more dependent on smugglers, actually perpetuating <laughs> the cycle. And this has been a story that has been going on for the last 25 years. So we see that there are several mechanisms that may well undermine the intentions of policymakers uh, to decrease migration, particularly when they're ill-designed and not based on a real knowledge of the process. My own research has focused on Morocco, and I think Morocco is a great example. Again, using our databases, we were estimating, to, we, were we were able to estimate total migration from Morocco to the OECD world, primarily Europe, and we actually see, as despite the recruitment stop in 1973, despite the introduction of visa regimes, migration has only increased over the years. Migration strategies have diversified. Moroccans have gone not just to France, but to many more European countries, have used the family channel, have used the irregular channel, and we see a continuation, even an acceleration, of Moroccan migration to the European Union and the rest of the OECD. Again, coming back to Suriname, but also taking two other examples, sort of highlighting this paradox that sometimes restrictions generate more migration <coughs> than non-restrictions is the three Guianas, again drawing on Simana Vetzolis research who's going to defend her PhD thesis next week in Maastricht based on this comparison of the three so-called Guianas. Guiana being former British Guiana, Suriname being former Dutch Guiana, and French Guiana still being a French department with free migration rights. Now if you look at the best possible estimates of the percentage of their population living abroad, we see both former British Guiana and Suriname having a fast increase of the population estimated to live abroad, about half of the population actually living abroad. 
In case of French Guiana, those percentages are much lower. This may underestimate some mobility going on that is not recorded, but still the, the differences are remarkable. Again, highlighting this migration policy paradox. One last is intra-European migration. This is a graph, the blue graph I already showed to you earlier. This is total migration to the European 25 from outside of the European 25, which we were able to estimate thanks to our new data. The red is actually reverse flows out of the EU 25, and the green line is intra-EU 25 mobility. And one of the remarkable findings is, despite the opening up of the internal EU borders, overall EU 25 intra-European migration hasn't gone up much at all. Despite huge differences within the European Union in terms of wealth and income, we see actually uh, quite stagnating levels of intra-European mobility. Perhaps it has a relation indeed with the freedom of migration. So what drives migration? Well, many things drive migration. One factor that has been ignored in this discussion generally is demand side drivers. This is a simple graph plotting GDP growth in Germany, a three-year average, and net migration rates. And we can draw these graphs from many countries and we see a very neat relation between how the economy is doing and the level of migration. Well, does this show that policies have failed? If you would ask me that question six years ago, before the project, I would have answered yes. But having studied immigration policies, I say no, because we have exactly redesigned immigration policies in such a way that they serve the economy. If you've got a labor offer from an employer, it's becoming increasingly easy to get actually a work visa if you're not from the EU compared to, let's, let's say, roughly 20 or 30 years ago. We have built in an economic rationale in our immig immigration policies to make it serve the economy. Well, other people have argued in the face of the apparent failure to contain migrants or stop migrants from coming to North America, to the European Union, to other wealthy countries, that we need development in poor countries. That is the real solution. It sounds logical, but again, data tell a quite more nuanced and complex story that may defy quite a lot of these assumptions. Because the intuition seems, seems correct. People fleeing misery, war, poverty. So if you decrease those, if you improve those circumstances in origin countries, you're likely to get less migration. Well, if you look at the data, and we divide all countries up, which I did in a 2010 paper, all countries up in the world in five quintiles using the Human <coughs> Development Index, which is a combination of GDP per capita, literacy levels, and um, life expectancy. So it's sort of a summary statistic of levels of human development. And then divide all countries in the world in five groups, quintiles, ranging from very low levels of human development to very high levels of human development. The first statistic, migration statistic, it's drawing on the World Bank Global Migrant Origin Database, are estimates about what percentage of population in all countries in the world are immigrants. And what we see here is very intuitive. It shows that in countries with low levels of human development, on average, only 3% or so are immigrants. In countries with very high levels of development, somewhere about between 14 and 16%, on average, are immigrants. In other words, it shows that it's pretty inevitable that if a society becomes wealthy, more people will come. Seems to tell an intuitive story. The surprise is more in the blue bar. We actually see it's not the poorest countries that generate most migration. It's typically those countries in this middle group. And that surprises many people. And considering the fact that many, for instance, sub-Saharan African countries are in the two left bars, you could argue that any form of development, if this is true, is more likely to generate more migration than less migration. But how can this be true? Well, I don't have time to fully elaborate on this, but there is good reasons to assume this is indeed to be the case. First of all, so-called developed societies have an economy that's much more complex, have much higher levels of specialization in terms of education and labor markets, generally tend to have better infrastructure, are more urbanized, simply have more people on the move for that very reason. But also, if we look at an individual level, in order to migrate, and particularly to migrate over borders and long distances, you need resources. Many people are simply too poor to move, for instance, to the OECD world. If they move, they may move between regions, within the country, but are much less likely to actually make it that far. 
it is expensive. You could add to that that factors like education, access to information, also increase people's life aspirations in terms of their material, perceived material needs. Notions of good life may change. You can add that onto the explanation that development somehow may inspire more people to move, to meet certain standards of living they would perhaps not have before. So what we see is a much more complex and non-linear relationship. What about this other idea that migration leads to a brain drain? It's a recurring argument. Again, Paul Collier has, I think, reinvented the brain drain quite recently. And again, it seems to make sense. People leave their countries of origin. It's a huge drain on their development, particularly if those people are amongst the best and brightest. And I'm not going to say that this is never an issue of concern. But there is also good reason to assume, and here partly I draw on research by Michael Clements of the Global Center for Development, that it would be erroneous to think that migration is the main cause, for instance, of healthcare problems in some African countries. It reflects a broader healthcare crisis, and that many of the people that migrate, for instance, from a country like Ghana, wouldn't have provided primary healthcare in rural areas, for instance. And so the idea that migration is the main cause of development stagnation in origin countries, perhaps highly skilled people moving out is more of a symptom of the lack to provide opportunities for such people in origin countries. But to see this as the main cause of underdevelopment would probably to overestimate the influence of migration. And there is also another side to this story, which is that migrants, even if they're away, also provide resources that can be useful for so-called development. This is a simple graph of the total remittances, and this is only the money that's registered by banks, sent back to origin countries. It is by far higher than official development aid. And this drew the attention about 10 to 15 years ago by uh, actors like the World Bank, and led to the sort of discovery of remittances as a main source of development finance. This idea, this is money sent back directly from people to people, isn't siphoned off, uh, it doesn't go into the pockets of corrupt government officials, maybe much more efficient than aid, and it led to a sort of euphoria around the issue. Well, is that euphoria then justified because it led to really representations of the migrants as bringers of development, much more efficient than governments? Again, there is a whole new literature on this. And I think it is important to put, again, migration in perspective. And we may run the risk, and I risk here talking myself out of business, to overestimate what migration can bring. Both the idea that migration can be this silver bullet strategy to overcome structural development obstacles in origin countries, or this idea that migration is the main cause of underdevelopment, is to overestimate what migration can do. In that sense, migration is not a um, development game changer. Obviously, we know that migration has used benefits for migrants themselves and their families, but the idea that migration can overcome more structural development obstacles like corruption, political instability, insecure investment conditions is very naive. It is to the same extent to blame migrants for structural development pro uh, problems in their origin countries. So you can see both vicious and virtuous circles. It has been described often that in Kerala and in India, or in South Korea, or in Turkey more recently, migrants have played a very positive role in terms of investing and return to the origin country. But I think it is important to set the causality right, because what actually convinced migrants to invest back in the origin country or region was actually favorable development conditions. Migrants need something to go back to. You cannot blame migrants for a lack of development. So neither the brain gain or the so-called brain drain is right. What about this other idea that migrants steal jobs and threaten the welfare state? Going back to the press, on the one hand, we see this idea benefits, but also the idea they take all jobs. So which of the two is true? Well, again, there is a huge literature now, mainly uh, good economic research, on the effects of migrants, of migration on income, on unemployment, and on the welfare state. And there's a huge debate going on on economists whether the average impacts are positive or negative, but actually the main conclusion I draw from that literature is that the effects are actually quite small. So this whole idea that migration is either going to rock the boat in terms of your development is prob probably overrating what migration can do. 
Yes, and overall migration has increases total GDP because simply the population becomes bigger. Even most estimates seem to show, if you look at average wages and average GDP per capita, there's a slight increase. And you cannot make this argument that migrants crowd out natives from the labor market. But if you look at research looking at the distribution of benefits of migration, we also can see that it's generally the middle and higher classes and enterprise that benefit much more from migration and migrants themselves than lower skilled people, and particularly former migrants who may well lose out because they tend to compete for the same jobs as new migrants. So yes, migration can be a source of innovation and growth, but again, to construct a big story of migration being the silver bullet developmental strategy is again overrating the importance of migration. And it brings me to a last point. There is this idea that migration can solve aging problems. It's often used by the pro-migration camp. Um, and I think it is, again, overrating what migration can bring as a form of structural change. And here we have to consider how the world as a whole is changing. Because what not enough people realize is that the whole world, in many ways, is running out of children. Fertility decline, as demographers call it, has become a near universal phenomenon. This is plotting just a few countries, and I have on purpose included a few major emigration countries, like Morocco, the blue line, and Mexico, the orange line. We see that those countries have seen rapidly plummeting levels of fertility. If we look at the world as a whole, and here I'm drawing on uh, data from Wolfgang Lutz, uh, we see that the whole world is changing. This is a population pyramid of 1970, and the red bars inside show people without education, the yellow ones are people with primary, and the blue, light blue are the ones with secondary, and the dark blue are the ones with tertiary education. This is the world now. The world population has become bigger and much better skilled. And this is projections into 2050. The whole world, in a way, is entering into an aging process. And demographers already 15 years ago from the United Nations Development pr 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 Program have argued you need ridiculously high levels of migration to in a way counter for aging. And even migrants themselves, they very rapidly adapt to fertility patterns in destination countries. It's, it's unimaginable that migration can be a fix for that problem. And just take one country, China, same graph, 1970, 2010, right now. These are projections into 2050. Now we know Ronald Skeldon, a uh, Sussex-based <laughs> migration researcher, has argued that China is already starting to attract migrants. Now if China remains stable politically, it is highly likely that China will draw in more and more migrants. It is in effect already attracting more and more migrants from, for instance, Africa. And that brings back a very different question. How will future migration look like? Migration is not a quick fix to aging problems, but the whole world is aging, and this will have fundamental repercussions on world migration. So why do we assume that all migrants will come to Europe? More and more countries are going to face aging issues. Migration is not a solution, but obviously demographic change can create indirectly a demand for migrant labor. So this is the end not entirely of this talk, at least I try to highlight seven migration myths and see how evidence forces us to rethink what is migration, what drives migration, and what are the impacts of migration. I think the most important lesson is, is that migration is indeed a normal process. Migration is of all times, it's a cliche, but I think it's a cliche worth repeating and taking very seriously. And it goes further than just describing migration patterns. We can even say that human mobility reflects this capacity of freedom of people to choose where to go and live. It's something intrinsic to well-being. You don't have to migrate to enjoy that freedom. We all, in Western liberal democracies, enjoy the freedom to run for office. Very few people actually run for office. The idea of having the option actually can give you satisfaction. Jürgen Karling, a Norwegian migration researcher, has argued we don't live in a time of, of an age of migration. We live in an age of involuntary immobility, that a lot of people in the world feel deprived of mobility rights because of visa policies and develop this obsession with migrating. So these are the, some of the issues. About migration policies, I don't think we can say that migration policies have generally failed. That would be an, over, uh, that would be an outrageous statement because most migrants follow the rules. We know that the big majority of migrants, for instance, in the European Union, are totally legal. They follow, they abide by the law. It's a quite small percentage of migrants that can be categorized as irregular. But yes, we see that certain immigration policies 
do not produce results that are anticipated by policymakers, which is because they go against fundamental drivers of migration. For instance, labor demand, which is not met by legal channels for lower skilled migrants, is going to generate irregular migration. And this is what we've seen with North African migration to Europe and with Mexican migration to the US. A war, like in Syria, is going to generate refugee movements, a part of which will, part of whom will end up in Europe. So the more fundamental lesson is that destination and origin states influence migration, not just through migration policies, but through much more fundamental processes, m much more fundamental policies that drive the economy, for instance, and the way we live. Give you just one example. For instance, social policies. If we think about childcare, just take one sector, we see there is quite high migration of people providing care for families and children to countries like the United States, but we also see it in Southern Europe, for instance, to Italy and to Spain, also for the elderly, by the way. We see much less of such migration to the social welfare states in Northwestern Europe and Scandinavia, because a lot of these care facilities are provided by state subsidies. Now, this is not to say I'm in favor of one of the other. I just give this example. For instance, if Scandinavian countries or the Netherlands or Germany would reform their welfare policies and, for instance, cut subsidies for subsidized childcare, you're going quite likely to generate a demand for this labor from migrants uh, that may well come uh, as irregular migrants. And Stephen Castles has made this bigger argument. There's a fundamental discrepancy between a tendency to deregularize our economies over the last 20 to 30 years. Some call this neoliberalization on the one hand, and on the other hand, the demand for less migration, because we've created a lot of labor demand for types of jobs that natives are less likely to fill than non-natives. So we need to think beyond the migration policy if we think about influencing migration. We need to go beyond migration policies also to enhance the development potential of migration. If we think about the concerns of origin countries about the brain drain and about the migrants being useful in terms of national development, it's much more about creating conditions that are favorable for development that will also draw back migrations, uh, migrants to the origin country. But migration policy also play a role because we often talk about circulation being good for development, people moving back and forth, but that would require actually making immigration policies more liberal instead of more restrictive. And of course, this is a politically very contested issue. But last but not least, I think what is the biggest threat is xenophobia. And what we see right now in Europe around the so-called refugee crisis it's not so much a crisis about numbers, because if we talk about, let's say, one million refugees, perhaps less, perhaps more, in 2015 to Europe, considering European population is 550 million only for the European Union, 700 million for the whole of Europe, of course this is something that can be managed, but it requires political solidarity between EU member states. This is a political crisis to start with. It's a problem of xenophobia that's party driven and uh, by politicians themselves that add to the already existing fears amongst populations. So I think the real call is for responsibility of policymakers and politicians to calm down the fears and to explain in a way that this is an issue we cannot think away and we are bound to deal with whether we like it or not. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Hein. Um, we obviously have a huge amount to unpick from the wealth of data and facts and myth-busting Hein's just given us. Um, just a couple of things to say. I will try and take uh, questions via Twitter if you're watching online. Um, and uh, this is being live webcast and filmed, so if you don't want to be on the internet or on video, I'm afraid, please don't ask a question. I mean, you can always tweet me and I'll do it for you. Um, so I'm going to run around with the mic and behind, please just uh, pick people. We've got about half an hour. So hands up. Anyone got a question? I can't believe there aren't any. Oh, right. Just here. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, 
for, as we said, wealth of information there and data. I was just curious, um, regarding forced migration, you talk about migration as a whole not necessarily changing that much, especially if you look at the um, percentage of the world population, but is that a different image if you consider forced migration? Uh, or um, would that be a similar trend? Thank you. Yeah, perhaps I went over it too quickly, but uh, as far as estimates of numbers of refugees worldwide is concerned, we see those fluctuating over time, obviously linked to levels of conflict in origin societies. But those are still numbers that are quite small compared to other migrants. So whatever estimates you use, they tend to be 10% of the world migrant population or less. So refugees and, and displaced people, forced migrants, are a significant share of the total uh, migrant population worldwide, but the image, this is somehow one of the main drivers of global migration, is a little bit misleading, particularly if we consider migration to the wealthy world, because 80 to 90 percent, according to UNHCR estimates of forced migrants, actually are within developing regions in neighboring countries. So I think it is not to say this is not an issue, it's a huge issue of public concern, humanitarian concern, but in the bigger scheme of things, because it, the current media frenzy around the refugee issue can easily lead to the conclusion that, for instance, most migration to Europe is now about refugees, which would be a misleading conclusion. If we haven't got one in the room at the moment, I've got somebody um, asking on Twitter, just in response to the busting the myth about um, migration can help solve the aging problem. Somebody's asked, or, or po uh, um, posed a co slightly contrary view, saying, well, if the average age is lower, the average age of migrants is lower than the native population, can't it help soften the transition in, in a given country? Well, it can perhaps soften the transition, but you would need such high numbers of migrants, you can never counter that fundamental trend of population aging, and actually immigration rates are not that high in, in, in that sense. So, yes, of course, if you have an aging population and a growing economy, you're likely to have labor demand in several sectors of the labor market. This is why a lot of aging countries generate a demand for migration. But the idea that their migration is going to solve that more fundamental structural problem built into the age structure of the population is, um, is much less likely of a scenario because, first of all, m the number of migrants simply is too low to really counter that fundamental trend. Second, we know from research that migrants assimilate very rapidly in terms of demographic behavior, in terms of adopting similar fertility norms as destination uh, countries. So this is, yes, it, it could soften demographic transition, but the idea is a sort of more fundamental solution, which would require very different sets of policies. Anyone need the mic in the room? Um, I was just wondering about uh, the relative, you, you spoke about um, this being a political crisis um, and, xenoph and xenophobia um, being driving this media frenzy. I was wondering what you think the relative role of politicians versus the media is in perpetuating these myths and how they might be countered. I think it's very easy to blame the media. I think what we see right now, I mean, media are almost by na nature sensationalist. I mean, good news doesn't really hit the headlines. So I re recently read some news items somewhere on the last page of a newspaper in the Netherlands that uh, actually very few people complained about resettlement of refugees within the Netherlands in different local uh, d different towns, and that doesn't really hit the headlines. If something happens, like a fight between refugees, then it, of course, hits the headlines. So I would find it a bit too easy to blame the media. I think the main responsibility here is with politicians. And that what you see right now in Europe is that not enough European policy makers make the simple case that this is a problem we cannot really think away. It's an illusion that we can prevent people from entering into Europe. Um, and that the only sensible approach is to develop a common approach. Because what is happening right now in Europe is that lots of European countries have more or less a free right on the hospitality of a few European countries like Germany, and which can undermine political support in those countries for refugee reception. So I think that's the real issue. It's a lack of solidarity within the European Union. And it's explicable because national politicians, in order to win elections, they have this natural drive 
to, and this is fear of the extreme right wing, which constantly raises this issue about refugees and migrants being a threat to the welfare state and to security. So the temptation is always there, but I said it's a lack of responsibility because we see fears and concerns amongst European population. I think the role of politicians is to, to somehow try to explain in a way to, 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 to populations that we have to do something about this issue and we cannot simply think it away. And I think there's a lack of responsibility taking on a European level, particularly on national state level, in this issue. This is why this is, in my view, a political crisis rather than a crisis of numbers per se. Um, I have a great question from Twitter, or at least I think it is, um, from Seb Fox. What do you think the results of a global open door policy would be? I think it's, I'm not against migration policies. I'm not against migration rules. I think there's a lot of sense for national states to have certain rules about who is member of the political community, who's member and who is not member. So I think to have a certain system, as long as we have nation states and a global system of states, there is probably a case to be made for migration policies. I've also tried to argue that the real issue about migration is not more or less restrictions. The real fundamental feature of immigration policies is selection. Who is more welcome and who is less welcome? That is really the real character of migration policy. It's a very complex system of discrimination in a way that makes it easy for some people to migrate and less easy for other people to migrate. Now, perhaps in some ideal future, you can imagine such a world, but I think for the shorter to medium term, this is not a sensible solution because it would simply not uh, get enough support. And it would also require coordinated action on a global level, which I think is very difficult to imagine on the short to medium term. But I think it is important to take the historical experience into account that, for instance, before 1991, North Africans could move freely to Southern Europe and we did not see a migration invasion. This doesn't necessarily mean that if you open the borders, no people would come, but I think it's important to take those examples into mind or the three Guyanas with free migration actually not leading to huge uh, migration and that perhaps borders have also created a sort of migration obsessed minds in many origin countries where people feel really deprived of that possibility to look around and if you don't like it, to return. So I think we are not sufficiently uh, aware of those historical examples of free mobility where we didn't see massive migration going on, but actually rather people moving back and forth. The same for so-called guest workers before 1973, or the so-called workers from Mexico under the Bracero program, who tended to circulate a lot, and we don't really learn from those historical lessons. And it's too easily assumed that um, liberalizing border controls or liberalizing immigration policy will lead to mass immigration. Actually, we have in Europe a few examples with the opening up uh, um, for, for of migration for Eastern Europeans that on a European level it has led to a temporary increase of migration, but actually a leveling off pretty soon later on because they also now enjoy free mobility rights. So I think we need to take those lessons into account and could provide an argument not to just assume if we somehow make circulation easier, that we will f then face a massive migration invasion. We simply don't learn from history if we think that. Who's next? Uh, down here and then I'll come down there. Um, you sp sp spoke about the selection process. Um, you've said before that it's not just um, in the receiving country but also at the sending country policy level. Would you say that there'd be a shift in our conversation about migration if we're looking at um, restricting or loosening sending country policies about labor stickers, work permits, and the like? Can you repeat the last bit because of Would there be a shift in our conversation about migration um, if we're looking at sending country restrictions being loosened? So the circular movement, would that kick in? Would we see the graphs not, be, not spike as much? if also at the sending country level there weren't such limitations imposed. Okay, yeah, it's by the way interesting to see that um, a lot of countries uh, be in, in previous decades had m a lot of exit restrictions on people actually moving out and trying to prevent people moving out and to pick up the example of Morocco which I know best. Before 1991 you could move freely to southern European countries but actually it's quite m difficult to get out of Morocco because it was very difficult to get a passport and it was one of the prime instruments the Moroccan government used to regulate who could move out and who could not move out. And if you go even further back, I mean, somebody like Zolberg, a very eminent migration scholar, has argued that we've witnessed an exit revolution, that actually 
early states, modern states, had an interest in keeping people in the state because people were a prime resource. Think about the army, for instance, and think about the agricultural labor force. People were seen as a key resource. But with mechanization and fast population growth, populations have become to seen less as a resource, and the focus has shifted from emigration controls to immigration controls. So one has somehow replaced the other. So, but you would need, of course, both to be free to have more circulation. So I, I hope this addresses your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting. Um, it was interesting when you showed these examples uh, from China and from Germany, and they show that same kind of arguments has been used, like representing immigration as threat. And of course, we know history of those countries and what were the reasons why it was developed. But what do you think now, this time, why in Europe we have this need? What has created it that we need to represent immigration as threat? I mean, well, on the one hand, I try to show that representing migrants as a threat is not a new phenomenon. And we do see it through history, this reappears in particular eras. Uh, particularly perhaps in a combination of economic issues, it becomes attractive for particular political entrepreneurs to make a linkage between the real perceived problems, for instance, right now in many European countries, of uh, lower skilled workers that are not migrants, uh, that do face the downsides of economic policies that have been pursued in terms of lower labor security and unemployment, lower level of uh, welfare, so they may perceive a real decline in their economic and otherwise well-being. Of course, it's very attractive for political political entrepreneurs to make a link between the presence of migrants and, 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 and asylum seekers and those problems. To make, for instance, a link between lack of social housing, public housing, and immigration. Whereas the real cause of a lack of social housing has been cutbacks on the social housing sector and the relative contribution of migrants asking for such housing is actually very limited. So it is very attractive to make that linkage, even if the causality doesn't really work, that the real reason why a lot of so-called native workers feel less secure uh, about their economic future has been structural changes in the economic policy that have been pursued. Whether you agree with those policies or not, that is the prime cause why many low-skilled workers, people with lower education, lower incomes in wealthy countries feel more deprived than, let's say, one or two generations ago. And then it's very easy to make that issue linkage. Also, Thomas Piketty has made that argument in his book on inequality. He has argued, of course, it's nonsensical to argue, and there's no ev evidence that migration, uh, migrants have been the cause of increasing uh, structural unemployment and growing job security. But you would make um, think sweeter <laughs> for lower skilled people, so-called native low, lower skilled people, if you would improve their labor protection, for instance. It had nothing to do with migration as such, but it is very attractive, of course, for extreme right-wing parties to make that issue linkage. So in that sense, it is also a reason to rethink issues around inequality. And I think in that sense, the whole debate around inequality that is coming up all around the Western world is a welcome development that we sort of rethink uh, the way we design economic policies and the impact it has on people, which goes way beyond migration policies. Thank you. Congratulations on such an amazing array of statistics. But I wonder if you could give us some view about how secure the statistics are on both sides, comparing people who have to migrate to survive, and people like us, say, who choose and plan where we're going. How you pick up those under the radar okay. who I think are in large numbers. We may well underestimate the number of people, for instance, moving in those and from those poorer countries because the statistics may simply not pick up uh, some of uh, those people. Still, I think it would be I would say it would be misleading to think that the big story about migration is a story about irregular migration because many migrants, of course, people may at some point in their migration careers be in some form of irregular status, but the big majority of migrants does aspire to establish 
themselves. So actually, the censuses pick up quite some of these migrants, quite some of the countries pick up irregular migrants. But you're right that in, particularly in poorer countries with weaker administrative structures, you may underestimate the number of poorer people on the move. I don't believe it will turn the whole sort of story upside down, but I think you definitely have got a point. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I've been working on migration for a couple of years and I thought I know something, but I just realized I don't know anything. <laughs> so the question I have is one on discourse. So you have presented a couple of myths and you want to debunk those myths. But also you have had insisted a lot on some social issues, as I understood it, like that there's a discrimination between skilled and unskilled migrants in the right. So my question is, why couldn't the next project be one about truths of migration? Saying here are the truths we don't know about. For instance, that much of the money of many dictators is bunkered in Luxembourg and Switzerland. Or the fact that skilled migrants in the Netherlands are not expected to take the integration test, which all others have to take. Or the fact that you can buy citizenship in Malta, Spain, or all those other places. I mean, I'd be in favor of such an exercise, but also to also further dissect uh, the real drivers, for instance, of border controls. I mean, there's a whole industry. I mean, some people have written about the migration industry, and most people, when they think about migration industry, they think about networks and lawyers and employers. But there's a very different migration industry that's all the corporations that have an interest in border controls. Uh, defense contractors, research and development going on, massive funds being poured into border controls with very limited evidence on their efficacy, for instance, the whole fingerprinting business, the whole border fence business. Of course, those are big lobbies that also lobby European governments to invest more money in these type of enterprises. Now, what we know is that those policies, another myth is that smuggling is the cause of irregular migration. Now, smuggling is just a reaction to border controls that in a way drive migrants and asylum seekers into the arms of smugglers because they basically provide a service. Now, I'm not saying that these are fantastic people or don't never deceive people or they're not engaged per potentially in criminal activities, but still they provide a service and there's a very good literature on this. So you could also argue that the millions and billions invested into border controls, both in the United States and in, in, in North Europe, fuel a whole industry that extends to also detention and deportation. And there's a lot of vested interest in this going on. There's a lot of vested interest in migration being seen as a problem in need of management. So in that sense, there's a whole organizational infrastructure around it that has an interest in migration being seen as an essential threat to security in the so-called Western world. So I think that's another example, but yes, I would agree with that. I was wondering, what do you think European leaders should be doing to try and improve the current refugee situation? Well, I mean, it's very difficult. This is a complex issue. But as I said, this is primarily a political issue, that if Europe would get its act together, numerically speaking, a continent of more than half a billion people, of course, can deal with 300,000, 500,000, 1 million a year of refugees in terms of numbers and resources, particularly if we consider how much poorer countries host much bigger numbers of refugees. Just the fact that Lebanon alone, one of six Lebanese are Syrian refugees right now. There are many, 90 to 95% of all Syrian refugees, to take an example, are just in the neighboring countries, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. <coughs> well, there's a lot of talk in the European political arena about regional solutions. It ignores the fact, first of all, that most of those refugees are already in the region, but what makes it even less credible is a lack of support to actually providing facilities for my, my, the refugees that are already in the region. And we know that part of the increase of uh, refugee movement to Europe out of Turkey is, is due to the fact that there is simply lack of facilities for people to get integrated into the Turkish society. So there's a lack of real support. So a more credible Europe would get its act together in terms of somehow come to some form of responsibility or burden sharing, but at the same time provide genuine support to organizations and countries, but also organizations like the UNHCR, that provide assistance to refugees that would like to stay in the region. Because another myth is that everybody wants to go to Europe, and again, we know that many refugees would like to stay close to home. Some refugees will be quite eager to move on. But you cannot think away this phenomenon. And 
what we right now see is nationalistic responses uh, driven by short-term electoral interests, uh, trying to think away the phenomenon, think that the border can solve the problem. What we see that the border does, which we have seen recently with the Hungarian fans, is it just diverts uh, movements towards and through other countries, so it doesn't solve any problem on the European level. So I would say European solidarity, intra-European solidarity, is the only way forward. It's a complex issue, but it's the only way forward. And this is the way leaders like Angela Merkel, but also on the European Commission level, said the only practical and moral way forward is collective action on the European level, however difficult it is. Uh, you suggested that the um, only plausible reason for opposition to migration was xenophobia. And you seem to put it forward because you'd investigated some very plausible uh, other reasons which did not stand up. But is there any direct evidence that you can cite that shows that xenophobia is, is a, the driving force and explains much of the, 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 the effect we see in populations? And I was thinking about uh, public opinion public opinion polls over time and whether opposition to migration is really correlated with the, the source of the mi migrants, the type of the migrants. I, I, I imagine what you mean by xenophobia is people who don't look the same. Is, that, um, is it true that, that public opinion fluctuates because of that? And uh, I just put it to you to see if that's something you've investigated. It, it seems well, plausible but not proven to me. Well, some colleagues at Compass here, another migration research centre, have looked at public opinion on migration, which is actually remarkable stable. So the idea that there are huge fluctuations in xenophobia amongst the population, like questions that are being asked in polls, would you like to have an, a foreigner as a neighbour? Actually, people are quite stable in their, their opinions and attitudes towards migrants. There's always a stratum in populations that is somehow xenophobic. So that is actually, it seems to be much more, remark uh, much more of a stable sort of uh, a phenomenon, xenophobia. What it seems to be much more fluctuating is political party positioning. I've seen one PhD thesis written at the European Res uh, University Institute by Amber Davis, which tried to look at party manifestos in a few European countries. And th she tried to code party manifestos over several years. And what she observed is that with the rise of an extreme right-wing party, all the mainstream parties tend towards a more xenophobic position in the policy positions. Once a threat falls away of that extreme right-wing xenophobic parties, they move back to the middle. So although I agree we need much more research to this, it seems to be that the political attitude taking on immigration is much more volatile than it actually is within the populations, which is why I, it is plausible indeed that uh, it's primarily driven by politics, the way migration is being positioned and discussed in the public domain. And of course, that's picked up by the media quite easily. I'm just going to get another cheeky one in from Twitter and then we'll come back to the room. Um, there's a couple of people sort of talking on Twitter about climate change and migration. Do you have anything to say about yeah. what might happen, um, but also somebody asking, you know, maybe migration could be seen as a potential solution to the impact of climate change yeah. rather than a problem? Yeah. Now, how many myths can we address? <laughs> um, unfortunately, because I think there's a lot of reasons to be fundamentally concerned about climate change, I don't want to suggest at any point that I'm not concerned about this. But by using the migration argument, I think it is dangerous. It is also incorrect. There's quite some research that's been going on on environmental change and migration, and the sort of the big narrative that some try to construct around hundreds of millions of people on the move because of climate change haven't understood a few things. First of all, for instance, if climate change leads to deprivation or um, starvation in very poor countries, those are the people least likely to have the resources to sort of come to Europe. We know from research on drought, for instance, in Africa, a drought often increases short distance mobility, but actually can lock up people in the regions where they are staying. Um, and the second thing is, for instance, looking at sea level rise, these are slow onset processes. This idea that this is a sudden flooding and people will all move then to the west, I think it is not really understanding uh, the nature of migration processes. That is not to say that environmental change is not an issue of concern, and particularly, of course, vulnerable populations are likely to bear the brunt. Uh, 
of those changes. And that is a real issue and a real issue of concern. The point more is to make people more resilient in terms of to be able to survive those conditions. But to use migration as an argument, this is going to generate massive fluxes of migration, is simply not based on a solid understanding of what drives migration processes. It doesn't understand the time scale of environmental change. And the, I think, biggest danger is of, again, using a sort of anti-migratory feeling to further agendas that have nothing to do with it. So it is, in a way, being right for the wrong reasons. This is how I would see it. But of course, migration for those people who are in distress f because of environmental factor can actually be a factor that can make them more resilient. And we know that from research, that migration, particularly in poor countries, but here I'm not even talking about migration to rich countries, it's often about local migration, migration between developing countries, can be a factor that can make, for instance, peasant families more resilient because it enables them to tap into some other sources of income, for instance. So yes, it can be a mitigating factor, but I think it is quite dangerous to construct a big story about one of the reasons to uh, do something about climate change is mass migration. It's not, I think, getting the facts right. Um, so I've been trying to rethink migration and see it, as you suggested, as an inevitable part of wider social change. If everyone miraculously started to believe that in the whole world, and that was how migration was seen. How do you think migration itself would change? Like, do you think less people would migrate or more people or? Yeah, it's a big question. I don't know if there's an answer, but yeah, thanks. Now, now what I hope it will lead to more informed assessments about you know, what policy can and cannot make in terms of influencing migration, that if migration policies go against in a way the main drivers of migration, then they're likely to be very ineffective and generate all these unintended effects. If migration policies somehow are linked and go in par with more fundamental drivers like the structure of labor demand in receiving countries or indeed conflict in origin countries, then those policies are more likely to be effective. And that is an argument you can, for instance, make in relation to irregular migration. I think it is an illusion to think there will be an age, as long as you regulate migration, there will be a certain percentage of people moving irregularly, that is not necessarily a huge problem. But of course, if these numbers become very high, like for instance, the numbers of Mexicans in the United States without papers, it does become a real problem of uh, policy and social concern. Um, but you have to understand why this happens. And the reason is simple, because the US has a structural labor demand for low-skilled workers in agriculture, construction, all sorts of services, catering, that generates a demand for labor. Now, if you are serious as a political community to do something about the migration, well, it's a democratic right of political communities to make decisions. But you have then to choose the policies that are affecting to deal with the issue, which c could mean that, you, that those sectors will go bust where migrant workers work. So in a way, you would have to take those consequences, which means that if you have, want to do something about migration, it means you have to do something about the fundamental drivers of what leads to that migration. Now, it's very naive to think about the future without migration to start with, but of course policies can do something about migration, but often not even to the migration policy, but actually to more general economic and social policies. Right, I think we've got time for two more, so we'll take, there's somebody in the, oh, and then there's one at the front. Yeah. Thank you, Ayn, for this presentation. I'm very proud to be in IMI today. Um, so my question is, as far as I understand your talk today, is you say that migration is, I would say, a permanent state. It means that always, in all time, uh, across the world or across the centuries, maybe, people are moving. So we can't do anything about that. Or So if we... Um, take into account this big context about the permanent state of migration, my question is, what is the true determinant of migration today? So maybe, I give you my, my opinion, but maybe you are not agree with that. As far as uh, you will see some disparities, you can, t you can say inequality today, but as far as you can see disparities between countries or within countries as well, do you think that is the true drivers of migration. 
Yes and no. Of course, it's difficult to deny that big, huge differences globally between countries is not one of the drivers of migration. But I think it is deceiving to argue from there that if those differences would be much smaller, there would be much less migration, because simply we see a lot of migration between countries with equal levels of development, which is partly due to the structural, what I call the structural complexity of, of, of um, highly developed societies. Just look at the labor market. There is a regularity between the level of education and the geographical size of labor markets. It simply means that people with low levels of qualifications often can find labor. For instance, if you work as a cashier, you can probably find work there where you live. You probably don't have to move in order to find work. The higher you get skilled, the bigger your labor market, the less likely it is you actually can find a job there where you live, the more likely you have to move. Acad academics are a great example of that, but think about other professions as well. So I think that's why it's somehow deceiving. Yes, you're right, of course, it would be better to live in a world with less differences in terms of inequality and in a world where people had real mobility opportunities. And with real mobility opportunities, I mean the freedom also to stay and to build a real life in way there where you are. That is real mobility because you only have agency when you have the freedom really to make those choices. So in that sense, yes, you are right. But then to think that in a hypothetical world where all countries are sort of wealthy, that there would be much and much less migration. I'm not sure, but I think it is dangerous to think that would be the case because there will still be a lot of people moving in, in between societies simply because the educational composition, the economic structure, other conditions keep, will keep on differing between countries and you will keep on having levels of specialization and all sorts of other reasons why people move, like falling in love and marrying and getting children, having to take care of parents and other family members. Of course, it will keep on keep mo people uh, moving. So you're right, yes, on one level, but on the other hand, to think that at some future stage when all countries would be equal, which I think is again quite unlikely, but even if that would happen, it would be sort of a dangerous assumption. I was recently asked by a journalist from the BBC, how would the world without migration be like? And I answered her, I find this a quite absurd question because a world without migration is not imaginable. We wouldn't have the societies which we have now with high levels of urbanization and industrial development. It is simply not imaginable. So it's not a matter of you're in favor or not. You may like global capitalism and the highly volatile societies we live in, or you may not like it, but it's part and parcel of that development, which is why I said to be in favor or against migration is almost like being in favor or against agriculture or in favor or against trade, for instance, because these are phenomena that have been around as long as uh, human mankind exists. Right, the bad news is we're out of time. The very good news is we've got drinks next door, so you can carry on asking Hein questions if you've got the time to stay. Before I thank him, I do just want to flag up um, a couple of events coming up. Um, those of you who come regularly will know that on the 23rd of November, we have our 10th anniversary lecture with Lord Martin Rees, so I urge you to come to that. He's a wonderful speaker, and we're very privileged to have him. Um, uh, tomorrow, no, 11th of November. That is tomorrow, isn't it? Sorry, I just went a little doolally. Um, we've got Bert Hoffman from the World Bank talking about the future of China's economy. So if you are free tomorrow lunchtime at midday, do come to that. That's going to be fascinating. Um, and I think uh, we should give Hein another round of applause. Very thoughtful presentation. Thank you.